On this edition of Backroads, we visit a nearly forgotten community in northeastern Montana. There's still that uh, Comertown spirit there, Comertown's community feeling. Introduce you to the art of glass blowing in Townsend. Yeah, go ahead and blow. Everyone thinks that all this air comes from your lungs. It's just a barely, barely a puff. Pay our respects at a new memorial to Indian warriors and learn to ski from a master teacher. Bounce a little bit, bounce, that's the way. Strap in tight. This edition of Backroads takes you to the top. Backroads of Montana is made possible with production support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. Travel Montana and the University of Montana, where the discovery continues. It's beautiful with spacious skies, has amber waves of green, and has purple mountains majestic that rise up out of the plains. And all across America, from sea to shining sea, where the mountains and the prairies meet, is the place I need to be. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, to places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Hello and welcome to the Backroads of Montana, a program about the interesting people and lesser known places that make Montana such a great place to live. Today, we're at Chief Plenicu State Park, which is near the town of Pryor, on the western edge of the Crow Indian Reservation. The park is the second oldest in Montana and was a gift from Chief Plenicu. This rare archival film shows the dedication of the park in 1928. It was cause for a great ceremony, attended by tribal elders and dignitaries from the U.S. government. In 1880, Plenicu visited Mount Vernon and was inspired to leave his home and surrounding lands as a public park where all people could gather and share stories. Our first story takes us to northeastern Montana in a town you've probably never heard of. In a beautiful location with friendly people, this town's reunion had it all. It's a Montana community that sounds almost too good to be true. They came from all over the country to celebrate the reunion. They hugged, they smiled, they told stories that people still have a hard time believing. It was all to celebrate their favorite place, Comertown. Comertown, we were all like one family. The Comertown family brought more than 200 people together for a picnic. They gathered for dinners. They even piled on a bus to go see the sights of town. There's Grandma's house! Yeah. Comertown seemed to bring out the kid in everyone right from the town's beginning. The railroad brought Comertown to life. The Sioux line ran across W.W. Comer's land, but instead of moving, he struck a deal to get a sidetrack to load cattle, and the town was underway. More people and businesses quickly followed as Comer Town grew. At its peak, the town had a cafe, two bars, two lumber yards, and even two general stores, Tweets and Rostads. I remember uh, Rostad, old man Rostad, uh, when kids would come in, he'd always uh, go over to one of the candy barrels and he'd get a handful of candy and say, ah, oh, you know, here's a young man, you know, would you like some? He'd, he'd hand out candy to kids as they came in, you know. It was great to be a kid in Comer Town, a special place filled with talented children. That's Barb Olson on the left. She was part of the tap dance group, one of the area's most popular attractions. We had a whole group of us and we'd go tap dancing like we went to Westby and tap dance in the gym. People would throw money at us on the floor. I remember one ball game in Honeywood. Uh, we tap danced during halftime, and everybody threw silver dollars at us. The floor was just covered with them. They had to get the broom out and sweep them up. <laughs> when the kids weren't performing, they joined the rest of the town at Comer Town Park. Most folks will tell you it was the nicest park in the county. But for the children and the adults, the heart of the community was Comer Town School. The 
the Comertown Coyotes. The high school was upstairs, the grade school was downstairs, and both of Dale Olson's grandmothers cooked the meals. We had a tough time in the mornings because you would smell that homemade bread being cooked every morning. You know, they cooked and baked all the homemade bread. And of course, they were good cooks. The second class to ever graduate from Comertown included old man Rostad's son, Merlin, an aspiring artist who needed some guidance from his teachers. All right, so I liked some of the girls too. we go tobogganing and stuff like that. And they'd come in, well, Merlin, you've got to get at the, uh, we want to give you good grades and we can't do it if you don't study. See, so I had that, I had a little extra push that was wonderful, really. One assignment Merlin and his classmates had in 1930 was to write an essay titled, What Will Comertown Be Like in 50 Years? Most of the students wrote something similar to what Merlin submitted. And then we kind of glossed it over a little bit. Well, uh, it probably stayed pretty much the same. Not everyone wrote the same thing. One student predicted a different future. But there was no time to worry about that. New faces were coming to town. Bob King was fresh out of college when he took his first teaching job at Comertown. A wonderful place, but difficult to find. And I thought, oh boy, where are we going now? <laughs> And uh, that road goes up kind of a hill. And the clouds must have been low that day because that road went right up into the, and disappeared in the clouds. And I thought, oh my gosh, where are we going? They were headed north where the Comertown winters were known for their 17 foot high snow drifts. It was almost impossible to travel. So the school had dormitories for the farm kids to stay in town. In the dorms, the older kids took care of the younger ones a job perfectly suited for one Comertown girl. The people that knew me then tell me I've been a mother all my life, and I guess that's kind of the way it's been. <laughs> the school, the businesses, Comertown seemed poised to grow. People were destined to find the place on the map. But if you try that today, there's one problem. Comertown doesn't exist anymore. It's a hauntingly familiar story for a small agricultural town in Montana. The drought years started the population decline. By 1953, Dale Olson's senior year, there were so few students, they had to close the high school. Never ever thought it would be the end of the high school. I was the last, yeah, there was, there was three in our class, you know. <laughs> By the 1960s, the only crowd gathering at Rostad's store was to auction off all the merchandise. By the 1970s, they pulled the last house off its foundation and moved it to a nearby ranch. Even the town's agricultural landmark burned to the ground in June of 2000. There was almost nothing left of Comertown. Some folks will tell you the town's ending was inevitable. Remember Merlin Rostad's senior class? There was that one essay that stood out from the rest. Clayton McCall wrote it exactly the way it came out. He said the town would deteriorate and the Rosthead store would be empty and the wind blowing through. Yet they still came back. They took pictures, they shared memories, and they celebrated. Sure, the tap dancers move a little slower. And the crowd doesn't throw as much money. But success stories are everywhere. The aspiring artist, Merlin Rostad, graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago, ran a successful business, and brought this drawing back to his hometown reunion. Marvel's experience running the school dormitory prepared her well to raise a big, beautiful family with 12 children. It doesn't seem quite right to say a town is dead. The streets, the buildings, the town park will tell you it's gone. But if you come back to this part of the prairie on a quiet summer evening, you can feel it. Comertown is still here. After the reunion, a small book with pictures and biographies was put together. If you're interested, you can get a copy by contacting the Sheridan County News. Upstairs in Chief Plenicu's home was a special room where he kept his collection of photos and sacred objects. He called it his honors room. 
One honor Plenikou received was to be chosen to represent all Indian nations at the dedication of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington Cemetery in 1921. On one of our travels, we met a nurse and a former blacksmith who began an adventure two years ago when they opened a glassblowing business in Townsend. They say they really haven't had a day off since they started because it's been just too much fun seeing what they can create next. Glass is just fascinating. It's, it's huge, hot, intense. It bends, it stretches, it, 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 uh, yeah, it is a lot like working with metal, but it's, it's shiny. <laughs> I had just wanted to do this forever. You know, that's just the way it is. Uh, I saw it when I was a kid, and I've been messing around with iron all my life, and, and just needed something different. The melting point is uh, around 17, 1800 degrees. We work it at 2000 degrees. Yeah, hey, go ahead and blow. The first bubble is hard. It's like blowing up a balloon. You know, the first gather, and it's, uh, it's trying to get cold on you as you're trying to blow some air into it. It's still fluid on the inside and skinning over on the outside. Everyone thinks that all this air comes from your lungs. It's just a barely, barely a puff. If you imagine running your tools over a, a plastic bag with some air in it, it's, it's like that. You know, it's, 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 that it's that soft. But it cools off so quickly. And fire is your friend. <laughs> and gravity is not your friend. <laughs> the colors, the shapes, the things you can do with colors, swirling them around. and it, It's just fun to put some colors together and see what kind of pattern you can make in the glass. And we, You can swirl it like a candy cane, like you're twisting ta taffy, and you can rake it and make different patterns in the glass. A lot of colors react and that's that's been a lot of fun is, is figuring out which ones you know red next to another color sometimes will stay red sometimes it turns black yep. and, uh, and again it's something you really don't know until the next day you know two colors don't come out in the piece until the next day when they cool down. It's definitely a team effort and you have to really be in tune with each other. And it's taken some time to get the timing down and know exactly what's expected of, of each other. And uh, the timing is crucial. You have to be there. Well, if you mess up, you get burnt. So it doesn't take very long to you know, get your steps in order. There we go. Well, it's hot, <laughs> usually really hot. Uh, it's more mental than anything. Hey, <laughs> showtime. Let's see what's in here. You know, once in a while we get something we feel exceptional, which, you know, six months down the road we probably won't think that. But, oh, look at this base. But for right now, we're, we're sort of on an upswing. We're, we're pretty happy about the direction things are going. Yeah, that's a beauty. Yeah, we've got a lot of... A lot of time ahead of us to get more experienced at this whole thing. Yeah, if you work hard at it, you can really, you can get better you know, in, a, in a short amount of time. And that's, that's fun, just to, just to know you're at least headed in the right direction with this stuff. Goose Bay Glass is named after the bay on Canyon Ferry Lake where the couple live and where they started the business. And remember that goblet they made during the story? Well, they gave it to our crew as a gift. The couple says they will progress in their glass making and perhaps take a day off occasionally. The newest part of Chief Plenicu State Park is this museum with interpretive exhibits and interactive displays about the chief and the Crow tribe. But the oral tradition of history is still very much alive. Dr. Phil Beaumont, a Crow elder, told us his eyewitness story about the dedication of the park in 1928. 
My grandmother had a bunch of food there. So we all had dinner and good time. Everybody, everybody invited their relatives, which is traditional. There was a, an apple tree at the time. We sat under that apple tree, and you could see where all the uh, official ceremony went on. They had dancers in front of the, uh, the group that award dance. There was speech, both sides. They said, because he Penacruz's idea of friendship is so great that today he's going to deed this property over to the general public so that everybody can enjoy it. Dr. Beaumont says Chief Planiku taught many lessons, but one was most important. Uh, he uh, told his people, he said, education, the modern, the modern education, math, English, science, he said, learn that. Education is your most powerful weapon. With it, you can be unequal to the white man. Without it, you will become his victim. Plenicu was the last traditional chief of the Crows, receiving many honors and lasting fame. Other warriors, Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, received little, if any, recognition, although they fought and won the most famous battle of all. The Lakota called it the Battle of the Greasy Grass. It was a fight to defend a homeland. It was a fight to defend a way of life. Indian warriors gave their lives here, but for years the only prominent physical monuments belonged to the 7th U.S. Cavalry. The slow change began in 1991 when Congress passed a law renaming Custer Battlefield and establishing an Indian memorial. After a national design competition and approval of federal funding, the memorial was finally dedicated in 2003. Uh, I can speak for myself as a Native person. I'm, I'm in awe to see this memorial. Uh, just like the Cheyenne said, you know, there was nothing there and there was just grass and, and vegetation and now there's something there. The memorial was designed with a direct connection to the 7th Cavalry Monument. According to the designers, an opening in the earthen base serves as a gateway. It's lined with a weeping wall to signify the conflict between the two worlds. The interior walls feature pictographs, quotes, and names of all native peoples who participated in the battle. The Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Sioux warriors, the Arikara and Crow who were scouts for the U.S. Cavalry. It's tribal diversity that brings many perspectives to the memorial. It's a very personal thing and what it means to you or what it means to me or what it means to a Cheyenne, to an Ogallala Sioux, to a descendant of Sitting Bull, Gaul, or to descendants of Crow Scouts is gonna vary. And that's the beauty of the Indian Memorial. On the north side of the monument are the spirit warriors. The artist interpretation describes the first image as a plains warrior in full headdress. He represents the great war chiefs present at the battle. The central warrior represents legendary plains horsemanship as this rider tries to remain invisible to the enemy. The last warrior also includes a woman. She's a reminder that even the bravest warrior came into this world through a woman. The memorial's theme is peace through unity but as an Aglala Lakota elder said, if this memorial is to serve its purpose, it must not only be a tribute to the dead, it must contain a message for the living. You can visit the Indian Memorial at the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, which is open year round. Chief Plenicu opened this grocery store where he sold staples and fruit from his orchard and taught the importance of farming and commerce. As a child, Plenicu had a vision. The elders explained to him that he had foreseen the end of the Indian way of life, the disappearance of the buffalo, and the coming of white settlement. 
Chief Planiku encouraged the Crow Indians to work with the dominant white society and learn their ways to the advantage of the tribe. The Crow tribe's emphasis on education was a result of his leadership. Teaching plays an important role in our final story. We met an anaconda woman with a remarkable gift. She's learned to stay young by teaching the young a sport she truly loves. Yeah. Ooh, that was a great one. Oh. Kind of like a roller coaster. Oh, I want to go again. I want to go again. <laughs> but my favorite part was when I was going down the hill on a speed. I made it. <laughs> Nobody teaches children to ski better than Jean Mills. All right, great. Very good. It's really a thrill. And um, just like this morning, that little girl was the first time, and just to get her to make a little turn, it, it's really fun. Jean's trip down the slope started in 1937 when she got her first pair of skis for Christmas. By the 1940s, Jean and her husband Jim were making regular trips to Sun Valley, Idaho. Jean took a skiing lesson and immediately knew this was something she had to share with friends back home. It's like whatever I do, I think everybody should do that. If it was sewing, I thought, I, or if I bought a new sewing machine, I thought everybody should have that. Then they'd buy it in self-defense. It gets a sick of hearing. <laughs> so, so maybe that's the way they do with skiing. Jean worked full-time at the credit bureau in Anaconda and told everyone she met about her skiing lesson. The problem was there was no ski school nearby. So she and a group of friends decided to open a school on the weekends at nearby Wraith Hill. They started in 1950 and charged 25 cents a lesson. No, I always wanted to be a teacher, <laughs> so, and I didn't get to go to school to be a teacher. Excellent instructor, and who else can you learn to ski from but a good skier? She's still the best skier on the mountain. Jean set quite an example for her students. After she turned 50, just for fun, she started entering races again. Sure enough, she brought home several first place medals for her age group. But teaching skiing and sharing it with others remained her first love. She convinced 12-year-old Tommy Wright to give skiing a try. She's the first person I ever skied with, yes. Young Kenny Bloom started skiing even earlier with Jean. I was two years old when I started sliding around on the skis and three by the time she got me skiing and turning. Today, Ken is the ski school director at Discovery Basin and Tom is the mountain manager. Jean taught them more than just skiing. She taught them about the snow and the mountain and following a passion. She's taught me to teach. She's taught me how to ski. She's helped me professionally so many ways. And she's been quite an inspiration in just keeping going every day. A big piece of pie. Experience, uh, quality, and just a good-hearted person. And determined, I guess you'd have to say, very determined. Jean has always been determined to make skiing fun. During the 1970s, she retired from her job at the Credit Bureau and started teaching full-time at Discovery Basin. She helped start the kinder ski program for three to six-year-olds, the first program of its kind in the state. She coordinated school groups to come to the mountain and learn skiing. Through the years, she learned different teaching techniques for young people. When she wanted kids to shift their weight to make a turn, she used the technique known as calling the puppy. Here, puppy. Here, puppy. Bend down and touch your knee. You have to call your puppy. Then you start these little games, and we have pages of things like calling your puppy or picking the flowers or the apples and things, and that keeps them entertained. Experience tells it all. She's had more kids and taught more kids to be successful skiers than any person I know. Now that Jean's passed her 80th birthday, it seems she'd run out of challenges, but her biggest one was yet to come. Teaching a kid from the prairie town of Weibo how to ski. That's a, if you're back on your heels, the skis run away from you and you fall or can't keep up with them. Mm -hmm. So, so always, always lean forward. Mm -hmm. Call your puppy. Before long, I was calling my puppy. 
and ready for the big hill. As Jean patiently skied with me, it became clear why this has become her lifelong passion. Because you can go out and you can be kind of down, you know, but you forget everything when you start to ski down the hill and it's just a, a real pleasure. It had been 30 years since I put on a pair of skis, but Jean's approach to teaching put me at ease and I felt comfortable on the slopes. And for the record, I too passed the Winnie the Pooh challenge. Oh, you did! Oh, no! <laughs> We've spent the day at Chief Plenicu State Park. Plenicu died in March 1932. The Billings Gazette wrote, his character, courage, and genius were such that set down in any race, in any era, he would have made an everlasting mark. That's our show. We'd like to thank Susan Stewart Madison Horse, Doug Haberman, and the staff at Plenicu State Park for all their help. The park is open 8 to 8 year-round. The museum is open May 1st through September 30th from 10 to 5. We're always looking for ideas for back roads. If you know of somebody we should meet or a place we should visit, drop us a line at the Back Roads of Montana, the University of Montana, Missoula, Montana, 59812. And remember that previous episodes of Back Roads are available at city county libraries across Montana. As long as you keep watching, we'll keep covering the back roads of Montana. I'm William Marcus. See you next time. Backroads of Montana is made possible with production support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. Travel Montana and the University of Montana, where the discovery continues. Montana is Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes, I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Coming in off the road now, boys, you know I'm heading home.